Hello, Yakri here with a Dominions 5 tutorial, my first one. So I want to go over uh, as quickly as is possible for my slow pace, uh, the basics you need to start playing the game effectively versus the AI uh, versus players. You might need a little bit more knowledge to really uh, have things go well. Uh, but I think to, to get started and be able to just kind of learn through playing, I'm just going to cover everything you need to know in uh, two videos, one about uh, pretender creation, which is this one, and one about uh, expansion, right? So let's, uh, let's see, what's, what's, what's a nice easy choice? So we're going to talk about, uh, I think I'm, a nation I'm familiar with mostly, um, that's I've been experimenting with because it's new to the game, which is R Early Age Roos, right? So they're new to Dominions 5, and they're pretty cool. I like the various ages of Roos. Uh, and so this is their national screen. Um, well, we'll talk about this before we go to Pretender Creation, although it's not super important. I usually evaluate my nations in-game, but the, the nation, nation screen has become a little bit more useful uh, since Dominions 4, and uh, you can learn a little bit from it. So... Let's look at them. They have humans and chuds. Chuds are basically uh, bigger humans that have more hit points. Um, they like cold and have various abilities that make them more useful in cold weather. You definitely want to go cold scale three with these guys. I'll explain what that is in a bit. Um, what else do you need to know here? Um, magic magic paths, you're not gonna understand that yet, but I'll be explaining it soon, um, are a useful thing to know when you're looking at your nation. Um, Special abilities will be mentioned in here, although the guys Roost doesn't have anything super uh, notable. They said they have summonable beings of Roost. That's a notable thing, and their other nations will have stuff like, um, "Oh, our god doesn't lose paths when they're killed," which happens to everyone else, and or something special like that. And that's uh, worth noting. Um, now, it's not clear. It wasn't clear to me initially what this is, but the, see these units that are separated from the others. These are. Uh, Recruit anywhere units, right? Can be recruited in. If you look at the bottom part of the screen there, uh, thunder priests can be recruited in all forests, right? And these guys are actually quite good, um, and that's a pretty relevant ability because you can just go and build a temple and a lab on some forest, and you can recruit these guys slowly out there, um, which is great because you want a lot of mages in general in dominions. Okay, so we're not going to look at their troop lineup too much more because what we care about right now is pretender creation. Okay, so this looks like a bunch of Greek to you, but let's talk about the different types of pretenders first off. So, uh, pretenders by default are divided up by their dominion points. That's how much dominion they start with. Dominion is the sort of stat that determines how well your god's dominion spreads, which is important for a variety of reasons that we'll be going over soon. Um, and the starting amount determines how cheap it will be to increase your uh, dominion score. You're gonna have a, you have a certain amount of points you can spend to improve various things about your god or your nation. So, uh, dominion and uh, the the different types of pretenders um, are pretty much hmm, balanced around their dominion score. I guess is a good way to put it. So, like these guys are all similar in function. All the dominion one pretenders, they're all intended to be what is called a rainbow pretender. Right? It's a pretender that can take. A variety of magic paths and give you access to a bunch of different nifty things that you can do right but they are generally weak in combat uh, and either personally or as a battle caster um, and they don't have a ton of special abilities usually and you have to, you're gonna have to pay a lot to get your dominion up pretty high so you're not gonna be able to get like a six seven eight dominion ver score very easily with these guys um although there's not much reason to want that i think in the current state of the game so dominion two pretenders tend to be monster what we call monster pretenders um some other pretenders are thrown in with them like i think ghost king would be called a messenger pretender um because he, he, monster pretenders are mostly defined by their big fat chassis, right? They've got a lot of hit points. They can kill things really effectively. So they basically go into combat and slaughter people, right? Um, that's what monster pretenders do. And they're not as good at casting spells, but they are good at personal combat. Now, Dominion Three pretenders are generally speaking titans. Um, these are like large humanoid pretenders, right? Um, 
they, so they have a lot of item slots. Um, the, the usefulness of items is probably a discussion for another day, but suffice it to say that having more item slots is quite valuable, um, and that's what justifies the often higher costs of these pretenders, and it's why they have, well, I guess it's not really why they have higher dominion score, but um, they also tend to have about three magic paths, right? So we've got the Two Oz of War has Fire, Air, Earth, whereas the Vol of the Bountiful Forest has two water and one nature, right? So three paths in total. And that's pretty much borne out through these different guys. Um, and they usually have some special ability that also makes them useful. So we've got the All Father, Odin, over here with three magic paths. And he's okay in combat. He's got some base gear. Um, I wouldn't, I still wouldn't like send him in versus an army by himself, but he can, he has sailing, which is a very valuable special ability that allows him to take an army with him across the ocean. Um, he has glamour, which allows him to, uh, stealth, be stealthy and sneak into enemy territory. And it also makes him harder to hit in combat initially. So, you know, he's got a set of bound useful abilities, whereas Tizawaz of War over here has Combat Caster, making him better at casting spells in combat, Vol of the Metal Forest generates magical gems every turn, and so on. Whereas someone like Earth Serpent he doesn't really have anything like that. Instead, he's just good at combat. He makes people afraid of him, and he recovers from injuries, and he can go into the water and kill people, and basically all set up around killing people. Dragons are kind of similar, right? Like, you actually have Dragon Masters, so that's one sort of non-combat bonus but primarily they make things afraid of them and kill stuff and they can fly around and kill stuff um they don't have some sort of so i guess i would call it utility abilities they don't have utility abilities so to speak um now up in dominion 4 we have immobile pretenders immobile pretenders are generally intended to be blessed chassis or like big casters that you might use to cast um very powerful spells that require a lot of magic paths. Um, these guys are defined by generally being fairly cheap, as well as having, uh, let me do that, very cheap, as well as having like three magic paths and some unique abilities, but they can't move. That's their main drawback, right? So high dominion score, cheap, can't move. Uh, so let's take a look at Ermensul, for example. So he starts with three nature magic. Now, the higher the starting points in a magic path, the cheaper it is to increase it, right, to a high level. Um, and similar, same goes for Dominion. So with four Dominion, I can pretty easily get to six Dominion and like nine Nature, and that's quite, that's very high. I still have 66 design points left with him awake. Um, typically for a Pretender like this, you would make them dormant or imprisoned. Um, and then I could have really great Dominion uh, scales as well, right? So I can, I can crank this up. Uh, I'll tell you what these do in a bit, but suffice it to say more is good, right? So, all right, look, I've got a ton of points put into here. This is a very powerful starting setup. Uh, and that's what it lets me do. The thing is that he doesn't give me any other benefit, right? I just get these good starting scales for my, for my uh, nation. I get a powerful bless, but with the way bless used to work in Dominions 4, uh, you'd be able to have a powerful bless at the start of the game for your sacred units, even with Ermin Soul imprisoned. Now, in the way Dominions 5 works, there's these, these most powerful abilities are these incarnate only skills, right? So, like, regeneration is extremely good. Uh, but, uh, since it says incarnate only, that means that my pretender has to have awakened. It has to be alive in the game world. Um, I'm not sure actually it should still be alive. Maybe it could have died. But it has to have come out of its slumber. Now, in setting my pretender to imprisoned, as I've done, he it puts him in... Uh, sort of, uh, it imprisons him, right, and just like the name sounds, and he escapes and comes out to the game world in three years, give or take half a year. So that's, that's uh, a year is, what, 12 turns? Um, so it's going to take quite some time for him to get out into the game world, and so I'm probably not going to be able to use the Bless effect I get from him until it's almost irrelevant, right? So this isn't getting me a whole lot. Uh, and I actually would like to have a Bless, so I really need to take a Pretender that I can start out with Awake. Um, so let's see, uh, before I get into that, uh, it just covers the different purposes of these different guys. So, let's talk about Magic Paths. We'll put the Great Sage on here for fun. So, there are, what is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Magic Paths available in Dominion, um, and they all have their own different shtick. Fire magic is really good at evocation. 
you know, throwing fireballs at people, lighting the whole battlefield on fire, and so on and so forth. And it's pretty weak everywhere else. Um, there's always going to be some niche uses for it. Like, there's an enchantment called Flaming Arrows. It's very powerful and isn't a direct evocation. Um, but it's, it's pretty much just for throwing fireballs at things. Air Magic, on the other hand, is... Oh, wait, it's actually pretty similar. Uh, it's really good at Thunder Striking. Um, thunder Strike is, you know, another spell similar to Fireball, you know, Lightning fall, flies out of the sky and blasts people to death. Um, but it has um, some side uses. Uh, air magic is associated with illusion and some defensive spells like mist form that makes you or protects your cat, so the spellcaster from damage. Um, so you get a lot of useful stuff from that. Um, and you also now get so you get bless points for each uh, bless effect. Or that was, a, that was a terrible sentence. You get bless points for uh, each magic path that you have four more points in. The more points you go up in the magic path, the more blessing points you get, right? And you can add bless effects and they cost a certain number of points listed here, right? So fire, true to its uh, nature, has a lot of offensive abilities. A heat aura that fatigues out people around you. Death explosion, your sacred units explode when they die, killing people around them. Attack skill to attack better. You know, fire shield hurts people who try to attack you. Flaming weapons, well, your weapons are on fire. Awe, and awe is one of the different ones where, you know, anyone trying to take to attack a unit with awe has to pass a morale check to attack. It's a very powerful defensive ability, at least in, for anyone who's trying to attack you in melee. So, fire is, fire is quite good. Um, in short, flaming weapons, awe and awe are, like, the most useful skills here. Attack skill is also very good. Uh, inspirational presence... Not sure. I'm not. I'm not too sure about it. I'm not too sure about it. I think for some nations that um, don't want a real bless, but they want to just like pick up some fire magic, maybe it's going to be pretty good. But um, well, shrug. I'm going to do a full video about blessings separately from this. So for now, we're not going to go into all the details of bless effects. But I am going to discuss the rest of the magic school. So we we're talking about air magic. So air magic is illusions and some defensive spells as well as uh, some powerful offensive spells. It's a little mixed, maybe a little bit overpowered. Um, water magic has a lot of utility, um, a lot of spells that are especially good under the water, um, which makes a lot of sense. But uh, if you're not going to be fighting in the water, it's not necessarily as useful to you. Um, generally, of course, there are nations that are associated with the water that are gonna have access to a lot of water magic. Um, it has access, access to some pretty good crafted items yada yada earth magic earth magic ton of defensive ton of debuffing a little bit of combat capability so it's very light on the evocations and heavy on things that like strip enemy armor away give your troops improved armor um or utility effects that you can do out of combat and good crafted items and stuff um let's see we've got astral magic here um astral magic is generally the the stuff that people have to make magic resistance checks to avoid it's things like mind control and soul slay which instantly kills someone because you just destroy their soul um and things like that uh par things like paralyzing people um fatigue causing units to become fatigued uh as well as things like scrying distant provinces uh teleportation that kind of stuff Death magic over here. Uh, death magic is pretty self-explanatory. You know, necromancy, uh, decay, that kind of thing. You can cause units to age and die. You can put up enchantments to cause everybody to age and die. Uh, you can hit people with bolts of negative energy and kill them that way. You can raise the undead and so on. Nature magic. Nature magic is uh, has lots of things like uh, enlarging the size of your units to make them bigger and more powerful bark skin to protect your units so a lot of a lot of buffs that buffs that um increase your own unit's power in a variety of ways and um a lot of utility effects things like um webs to entangle enemies uh and uh out of combat things like summoning units and enchantments that buff units. So it's very, very buff-centric, similar to Earth Magic, but along different lines. Things like giving units more hit points, giving units regeneration, and so on. Blood Magic is a little bit unique among all the magic schools. Now, all the other magic schools besides Blood Magic use magical gems for their item forging and out-of-combat rituals and for their most powerful spells. Blood Magic, on the other hand, uses blood sacrifices for everything. Most, the vast majority of its in-combat abilities are 
require blood sacrifice and all of its out of combat stuff requires blood sacrifice and you get blood slaves by hunting for them in provinces with blood mages which reduces the um population of the province so you kind of damage your own economy to generate the secondary economy of blood slaves right to do blood magic things now blood magic is primarily a summoning focused magical path there's some decent magic items a lot of which are summoning focused uh, and there's some okay combat spells but primarily what you do with this is that you cast ritual spells to summon demons under your control uh, and that's what blood magic is all about it's also a little bit about horrors which are not under anyone's in particular control but you can mark enemy units so that they're more likely to die first when you summon horrors so that's a lot of fun um you mix it with astral magic to do that there's a lot of cross path effects which is a little bit of a more complex discussion for another time um but that covers all the magic school basics let's talk about your dominion effects right so the magic school things here up here right whatever you select here is going to affect your pretender and then any bless effects you select from the points you get from these magic paths will affect your sacred units right which are only a small subset of your the units you have access to now dominion effects on the other hand affect everything in your dominion right so dominion is like this area of the map that is under your god's control sort of um mystical control and how much mystical control you get is determined by your dominion candles right so um this is like a representation of your god's divine power and the higher it is the more it spreads out and pushes away other god's dominion um and anywhere where you have divine power right these effects are enacted as it were so we've got order and turmoil um if you have order it gives you let's reset all these to to the baseline um so order gives you income reduces unrest and unrest itself reduces your income so you do want to reduce unrest of course more recruitment points which don't usually matter um a lot of the time but if you have say a recruitment point penalty from going turmoil or uh need to recruit a truly huge number of troops in one turn uh, it could make a difference to you um and events there are random events that occur in the game and if you have high order fewer of them occur and if you have high turmoil uh more of them occur right um now turmoil just means more randomness right from these events where we also are going to have uh fortune and misfortune here which will influence them so in general having high turmoil is bad for obvious reasons because you get more unrest which reduces your income and you have reduced income from the turmoil itself so generally if you want more money for armies and whatnot and you want to recruit bigger armies you're going to want order uh, order is also good if you intend to take some penalty scales like misfortune um, that are going to uh, make bad things happen to you from random events okay so the other thing is that um, all these scales have a bad side and a good side and the bad side gives you more point design points and the good side takes design points right so each each skill costing 40 points so it's fairly self-explanatory pretty much any time where you're going down into these other uh, negative stats like sloth, uh, tur turmoil, sloth, death, misfortune, and drain. It's bad, and the flip side has good effects. Now, there's some one, one exception to this, or two exceptions to this. So, turmoil increases the number of events that happen. And if you have high luck, luck, luck itself uh, means that more of the events that happen are good for you. So, if you so if you have more events, more of the events are good for you. They're like they're slanted in your favor, and then you make more events happen. That's kind of good for you. So, having high luck, high fortune, sort of part, not negates, but reduces the influence of turmoil, right? The negative influence of turmoil, um, because you take advantage of that extra randomness. And now, uh, scales. These scales, uh, the heat cold scales. Um, whether or not they're good or bad is kind of subjective. Your nation is going to have a preference, right, for whether they like heat or cold or don't care. Um, and anything off of their preference is going to impose penalties on you, right? Fairly large penalties, right? For each point is minus five income. So if you're three points off, it's minus 15% income, minus 30% supplies. It's quite a lot. Um, now here's the thing. Uh, throughout the year, you get different amounts of uh, hot heat or cold uh, from the season you're in, right? So if you're in like late, what is it like mid spring? I think it's is when it's neutral. Um, so there's two times in the year when it's when the, everything's neutral, and you'll just be at zero hot, zero cold. 
and your dominion will take over. Now, the rest of the time, uh, it's going to be pushing back against your dominion. The time of the year will be pushing back against your dominion. So if your nation prefers cold two, and you go to, and you can't go higher than cold three, and you go to cold three, well, what this is actually going to do, going to cold three gives you 40 more points to spend, but it's essentially protecting you from heat scale, from getting too far down in heat scales and getting a larger penalty. It means that some, some of the year round, you're gonna have a 5% income penalty, but then a pretty good portion of the year round when it's warmer, it's gonna bump you down to two where your nation would really like to be, and a little bit of the year will bump you down to one, but you're probably never gonna hit zero or one heat, which would be really bad for you. So there's kind of an interesting thing going on there with heat scales. Now, growth and death. Growth and death is, um, it's been, they've been, uh, growth, growth, death scales have been lessened in value in Dominions 5, which is nice, uh, because they're extremely influential in Dominions 4. I think this is still the best income scale you can get. Let's see, well, let's order do. Yeah, okay, never mind. Maybe I, maybe I spoke too soon. Um, so growth is the best income scale you can get because not just because it increases your income by 12%, but it increases the population in provinces by 0.6% per turn. Now, the population of provinces determines a few things. It determines how much money you get from the province, and it determines how much resources you get from the province, and it determines how much recruitment points you get from the provinces. Um, all of which are very important for making money and recruiting units, right? So you want high, if you want to build big armies, you want high growth. Certain nations maybe don't care, like they want death because they plan to end the game so quickly that the penalties, like the growth penalty, the, the, the death, this actually causes death in your provinces and they slowly become smaller and less populous. Um, and they don't care about the death penalty, right? Because the game, they're gonna end the game before it matters or they're going to, uh, they, want, they want all their provinces to die. There's a nation called uh, Airmore in the Middle Age which is a nation of undead. So un death scales make everyone die faster, which is great for them because they're undead. They want everyone to die. Uh, but most of the time you're gonna want positive growth. It's a very powerful scale because the percentile income bonus, of course, is gonna stack with the bonus income you're gonna get from your provinces increasing in population. Now, uh, luck scales are important in a very unique way. So they increase random events and the amount of random events that happen, good and bad, and they make more, a larger percentage of those random events good. Now, um, the big advantage here is that random events can give you some oddball things, right? They can give you ma pre-made magical equipment, and they can give you magical gems. And magical gems is the big thing, right? Magic gems in this game are extremely important. They fund all the most important things you do in the game. Um, and there's, very few ways to get more of them, right? You have to find magical sites in game or you have to get them through random events. So getting luck scales like this uh, allows you to get more magical gems from random events just because more magic random events happen and more of them are good for you, right? So um, luck scales are really important for nations where magic gems are even more important than usual, nations that might summon units with magical ge gems like middle-aged TNT and other nations like that. Um, misfortune, on the other hand, is not too bad for nations that want to go like three order anyway, right? So you have not so much increased amount of events, and the events are bad for you a little more often. But maybe you don't really care. Maybe what you really want is like steady income, right? Is what you really need in unrest reduction. Then you know, all right, you take you take misfortune too, no big deal. Okay, so. Magic and drain. There's, a, there's one neat thing, one thing that I'm gonna have to mention that I'm not sure if it's still true in Dominions Five, but I assume it is. Uh, as far as I know, if you take drain three, it unlocks a random event that's extremely bad where you lose all your magic gems. So no one ever takes drain three. Essentially, you don't want to do it. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. Uh, I think I can't remember, but I believe magic three. I mean, I can't remember for sure, but I believe Magic 3, on the other hand, unlocks special events where you can get more uh, magic gems or some special stuff. Uh, so you could you could do that with um, Fortune 3. Another thing to mention about Fortune and random events is that uh, if you have a large income uh, percentage bonus, right, from having high growth scales, let's say you have like growth three and production one and order three. Now, a lot of times people don't take fortune and order together because order reduces the amount of events you get, which you really want more events for fortune, for going fortune scales, right? Well, the thing is that if you have a huge income bonus like this, then when you do get random events, they often have a larger 
um, gold payout for the ones that do pay out gold. Um, and growth unlocks some special random events associated with growth that are quite good. So uh, there's a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of strategy around that. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think this covers pretty much everything. Uh, I think I mentioned Awake Dormant imprisoned for pretenders to reiterate that though awake pretenders you start the game with the pretender immediately you have it on the first turn which you're going to want if you want to expand with sacred units early on like you know let's say i want i want to have the earth serpent this is something i would recommend for early rust right i have fortitude this makes units take half damage from basically all melee attacks and and arrows and stuff and any, any physical attacks from units and then you know i have to have some penalty scales to be able to afford this. Um, awake. So, uh, what was I going to say? So, if, if they're awake, then you immediately get them, and uh, your blessed units can have the benefit of this bless effect immediately. However, if they're dormant, if they're dormant, your blessed units will not get the benefit of any incarnate effects, and your, of course, your god won't show up, and uh, they'll, they'll show up in about a year after 12 turns, right? So, your god won't show up immediately. If you get them a little bit early, this isn't too bad. It's pretty fast. Um, a lot of nations can expand without their sacreds initially, and then uh, they can have this guy land, and then you can just take your sacred army out now that they've suddenly become good and massacre all of your opponent's troops. Now, imprisoned, on the other hand, if you choose imprisoned, your sacred troops that you get from your um, nation are probably no longer going to be really useful by the time your god comes out because. Um, sacred troops lose a lot of their value and battlefield magic is going to just slaughter them all um, which is going to happen about the time that a prison god comes out becomes awake um, there's maybe a few exceptions where you might summon sacred units late in the game that are quite good or maybe you're using sacred thugs um, but in general the reason to take imprisoned is so that you can have really great dominion scales but maybe you don't really care about your blessing and instead your god might have um, either a magic school selected so that you can cast some powerful enchantment or a magic school or a bunch of magic schools where you've like spread out your magical pathing so you can do a variety of useful things with them all right so i think this covers this covers pretty much everything um one other thing i guess i should mention um when i, when I talked about the different types of pretenders here and i mostly went over what they do um but let's let's talk about like what people do with different types of pretenders really quick so what people do with most of the dudes in here um mostly it's maybe not true anymore in Dominions 5. In Dominions 4, I wouldn't have recommended taking any Dominion 1 pretenders at all. They're basically all bad. Uh, in Dominions 5, maybe they're useful. Maybe. I'm a little skeptical. I think the the, the good point right now is maybe t the cheaper Titans, someone like um, Vol of the Bountiful for Forest at 210, or the cheaper monsters like the Ormer, um, or, an ex or an expensive expander like the Earth Serpent. Um, it's been nerfed quite a bit from Dominions 4, but I think it's still quite good. Um, so what I mean by this is that these guys are rainbow pretenders. A rainbow pretender is someone you take, um, a bunch of magic paths on, right? So you might take like the crone and you might take like four death and you might take four earth. And you might take five astral magic and you might also take, oh, actually fuck it. Let's take seven earth and we'll also take like four fire and like two water and two air or three air, four air, I don't know how we can afford it. And then two nature magic and then, um one two blood magic so now this is a huge amount of stuff right so we've got this we've got this blessing we're gonna get some other bless effects right so maybe we'll take uh inspirational presence to make our um commanders who are sacred a little bit better we're gonna take um well, let's see far shot no we'll take precision um so we're gonna make our spellcasters a little bit Actually, we're going to take Precision X4. This is going to make our Sacred Mages more accurate with our spell casting, and we're going to take oh, okay, Far Caster. Boom. So now our, our Mages can cast spells from farther out. Uh, ooh, what do we do with this? Uh, Arcane Sight. Ooh, minor Magic Resistance. And we'll pick up, we'll go over here to Death Magic, and geez, this is a little bit excessive, but we'll pick up Undying. Why not, right? Like, this is, we're probably not going to get a lot of use out of this actually at all. Um, death magic is kind of a crap one to pick up in terms of just like a little bit of splash blessing. I'd probably, maybe I'd, if I was actually doing this, I might do someone else, something else for the death magic itself is very powerful. So maybe it's, maybe it's worth it anyway. Right. Um, we need to get like at least like five of that. So we'll just go like three down to two. There we go. All right. So this is something you could, you could conceivably do. I don't know if I've really set this up 
well, there's probably better ways to do this, but what you get from this is that your earth magic um, and your astral magic, uh, there's a way that they combine that's useful. Um, in particular, you can craft an item that boosts your astral magic and you need two earth and two astral to do it. Now, the reason I have five astral and seven earth instead is because this nation does actually have sacred units and this fortitude that I've gotten from earth magic is quite useful. Although for this, actually, you know what? There's, there's a good point. Here we go. We'll go back down. We'll go reinvigoration one, reinvigoration two, um, and then maybe we'd even go higher, right? Like maybe we'd go even higher than that in, in, in reinvig, right? Like maybe I would, uh, earth six, let's go reinvigoration three, right? Let's go nature four and we'll get some, <laughs> we'll get some nature effects too. Why not? Right. Um, we'll get forest survival. Oh, that's actually pretty stupid. This is, that's not even good, that good. Well, what do we want? Not let's not do nature too. Let's do, let's do a little bit of blood magic. Yeah, Blood Surge. Blood Surge is like a reinvigoration effect that you get when you kill something. Well, your mages are going to kill stuff all the time, so that'll probably be great, actually. Now I've got even more reinvigoration. So reinvigoration um, allows units to recover fatigue. You get fatigue from attacking or from casting spells. So when I'm, our, our mages attack and kill something with a spell, they're going to get four reinvigoration, which is actually crazy high. So this is this is very handy. And all of this, all these benefits are gained even if the caster is in prison because none of them are incarnate effects. So these are all going to buff our mages when they're in battle. Um, and they'll be okay for our troops too, actually. Like, let's see. If, you're, if you have certain types of uh, blessed troops, they'll actually be kind of useful. So I actually would say that, that I think these guys will be good in uh, Dominions 5, perhaps, after all. Um, and so I get a lot of other useful things for this. So that's the real, this is not, these bless effects are not the real reason we would do this. Um, the, these scales are not that great for an imprisoned pretender. Um, overall, like mostly if you look from the bless effects down, this is not that great. However, uh, the magic pathing, right? Okay, so two water magic is all you need to scale, to build water magic boosters that allow your pretender to climb higher in water magic, um, and that's plenty. Air magic, however, takes four. Fire magic also kind of kind of takes four. Um, earth magic only takes two, but we got some more useful blessing effects from earth magic, so we went a little high in it. And having natural high earth magic is useful for a variety of reasons I won't get into here. Um, having earth and astral magic lets you boost your astral magic up higher, Specifically, having excuse me, Astral Magic 5 allows you to hit certain milestones that are very important, um, whereas Astral Magic 4 wouldn't let you do that. Um, so having Astral Magic 5 with Earth Magic 6 is particularly useful because I'm going to be able to get Astral Magic up to like 9. Um, and then it also lets you build these boosters that boost all of your magic paths. So I'm going to be able to boost all these paths up quite a bit. Having Nature and Blood, I think I've done it in the right... Um, I guess, I guess I won't be able to equip it on this caster, actually, because I wouldn't want to equip this one nature blood booster on your pretender because you can't unequip it. So it's probably a bad idea. But um, you can build some boosters with that. Maybe on a different character, this would be good. Um, the fire, air, and water together means that we're going to be able to build elemental staves, right, which um, boost all of your elemental magic paths. So we're going to be able to get up to, like, air six, fire six, water, or probably, like, five or six, um, earth, you're going to be able to get Earth up to like eight. Um, you're going to be able to get Astral up to like nine. You're going to be able. To, uh, I would like if you could squeeze another. Maybe you could like ditch Nature Magic and get a fifth point in Death, which is actually kind of handy, and would add like another point of Undying for no really good reason. Um, and now with five Death Magic, you can, you can build up your Death Magic. Uh, you can build Death Magic boosters, and that's quite good. Um, and so now. <laughs> Now when this pretender wakes up, they can do a shitload of things for you, right? In fact, uh, the one kind of weakness with this build is that they can do so many things for you um, that you're maybe not going to have time to do all the things that you're getting out of this, right? You may be getting so much out of it that you can't make use of it, and then it's not really useful. So eh, maybe, it's, maybe it's not that good. It also takes you quite a while for this to um, come online. I think, I'll, I think I'll use this for my expansion example and see if it works. <laughs> this is... Mm. I don't know. This is this is kind of bad. Maybe, maybe not. Hmm. Well, okay. So this is this is kind of a neat example. Um, you'll definitely get some ma uh, advantages for your for your spellcasters. Like they're gonna they can cast spells farther. They reinvig. They're really accurate. It's actually quite good for them. Um, it's gonna be good for a lot of different things. So oh wait, well that's where I was going with this. So that's what you can get out of these guys. Whereas like a pretender like this, right? What you do. These are all gonna be broken. Is you just go up to, up to like seven points in earth magic. You make it awake, and this thing. 
will uh, gain the benefits of its own blessing, right? Which you get that earth blessing that reduces damage by a lot. It's going to get bonus protection from the earth magic because that's the passive ability of earth magic pathing. Um, and it's already a really good combat pretender. So versus, versus almost anything, probably not a horde of barbarians or heavy cavalry because they're particularly hard to expand into, but versus any province that you expand into with this guy, it's going to be able to kill it. And you've also gotten a blessing that's actually quite useful for your sacred units, which this nation has decent sacred units. So that's what the monster pretender is good for. Now, Tilwaz of War, on the other hand, you might go like a certain combination, right? Like you get four of each of these, and let's say I'm going to get five death too. I'm like, choose four earth. All right, so now this guy, you go just a few magic paths and you make him maybe dormant, right? Uh, and when he wakes up, he's going to be a fantastic battle mage. Basically, without equipment, this guy goes into a province, he'll just die, right? But if you give him magical items and you uh, have these high paths right he's not going to die easily to any of the ways that someone could kind of like snipe a backline mage that you might have like the previous example i gave you with that old crone you couldn't just take her into battle though right she would die pretty easily um there's some ways you can prevent that but she probably kick the bucket um with there's a variety of ways you could kick the bucket very easily whereas this guy um he's not going to die to just aoe battlefield magic he's not going to die easily to people flying behind your lines and attacking him uh, and he's still, you can still get quite good magic pathing for not that much money, and he's, this can still give you kind of a variety bless, and it can give you some access to some really powerful magic spells. Uh, and you have him be dormant, and he comes out, and you go to war with another nation, and have this guy lead your armies and cast powerful battle mat field magic for you. And you can get the same thing out of any of these guys. Like maybe you get the All Father, and you, as soon as he pops out, you put a huge army on him, and you use sailing to sail across an ocean that your um, opponents didn't think you could sail across to raid their provinces from behind. Um, and then I've already told, I've already talked about these guys a lot. So these, these guys each have a different role, right? These guys come out early and you attack with them and you defend with them and you just generally fight. These guys come out like, you could, you could, they could come out early, they could come out late. It doesn't really matter, but they provide you utility, right? You set them up so that you get a lot of different magical spell boosters. You're going to get access to spells and rituals that you need in particular for your nation for some reason. And maybe you're going to do a variety bless that makes your spell casters a lot better, right? Because you're probably not doing a big major bless that makes your troops better, but spell casters can benefit a lot from these sort of variety that we've set up here where we've got like, they can cast spells farther out and they're going to restore fatigue so they can keep casting longer. And they're also going to be have much higher precision so they're going to land their fireballs and stuff a lot more in useful locations. Um, yeah, okay, so this, this kind of ran over quite a bit, but the pretender creation is very complicated, and, you know, Dominions 5 has actually probably made it more, a lot more complicated than it was before. All these bless effects would have taken me like a quarter of the time to explain in the past, and now I haven't even covered everything there is to do, cover about bless effects by a long shot. Um, so I'm going to have to do a separate video about that. The next video will be a little bit shorter, I hope, and uh, be about expansion. And all you really need to know is, like, how do I create a pretender that's kind of useful, and how do I expand? And, and like, a short version for creating a pretender that's kind of useful is you pick a pretender out of these guys. You can't pick just any of them, but maybe pick a dragon that's pretty easy, or you pick the earth serpent. That's pretty easy, right? You pick the earth serpent, you give him seven earth, and you, uh, instead of reinvigoration, you pick up, like, fortitude, right? That's a really good one. And now, for sure, he can expand, no problem. Uh, as an awake pretender or you don't you only get like six points in earth and you pick up reinvigoration a couple times and then you have them expand anyway and you're good to go uh, and that, that that would be if you don't have good sacred units you would do just the reinvigoration um and or you can you know you could do something like I did with the crone like I showed you with the crone having like a bunch of magic paths so that you could fill all these bus effects and you have her in prison and you expand just with your with your regular units I'll talk about that in the expansion video like I said um yeah, that's about it. So this gives you an idea of how to create a pretender. Um, <laughs> depending on your specific situation, uh, this this doesn't even. I guess this. I don't know if this even really begins to scratch the surface because depending on the specific situation you're in, you know, I could probably do a tutorial like this for every single nation in the game uh, before I actually had like sufficient depth to really have covered the issue. Um, but there are people out there in the Dominions community willing to help. You could always ask on the Steam forums or post a question on one of my video videos. I do pay attention to those and I try and answer fairly quickly. Um, I'm always happy to help. Uh, if you have like a question about what might be good for a specific nation, I haven't played every single nation in this game yet, but uh, in general, I can at least theory craft a pretty good solution for anything that comes to mind. Um, I think that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope the rest of the videos I make will be very useful to you as well.